evening and welcome to the last weekend of programming in the first phase of Contagion. Contagion is the fourth exhibition organized by Science Gallery Bengaluru. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Science Gallery Bengaluru is a part of an international network of galleries. We are one of nine in the world and we are a public institution for research-based engagement. Today's lecture, uh, like the 22 other lectures in this public lecture series, is supported by the Indian National Science Academy. And I'm very happy that we have with us uh, Sabrina Scholz, who's a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum uh, of Natural History. But before I introduce her and uh, share the title of her talk with you, just allow me to mention um, that we have two more public lectures coming up. Um, so tomorrow and then the last one. So tomorrow we have Madhav Marake talking about digital epidemiology and the closing lecture will be given by Jeremy Farrar, who is the director of the Wellcome Trust. Don't forget to join us for a walkthrough of the museum and public health center at the Robert Koch Institute um, on Saturday at 4 p.m. And then we have a guided tour of Dr. Jenner's house, which is the early history of vaccination um, on Sunday, 13 June at 4 p.m. So as I said, I'm extremely happy to introduce to you Sabrina Scholz, who is a curator of biological anthropology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. She's the lead curator of the outbreak about which we will hear more. Outbreak, epidemics in a connected world, an exhibition, and she is a World Economic Forum young scientist. As a biological anthropologist, she uses museum collections to study intersections of human, animal, and environmental health in the past and the present. She received her PhD in anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and completed her postdoctoral work at University of California, Berkeley in the Department of Integrative Biology and at Stockholm University in the Department of Biophysics and Biochemistry. Please do not forget to type in your questions in the Q&A box and do not forget to leave us your feedback. Over to you, Sabrina. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, good. I guess we can all see that. And uh, let me uh, do this. Right, okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really honored to be speaking to you today from Washington, DC. I want to thank all the organizers of the Contagion exhibition for giving me this opportunity to participate in such a wonderful initiative uh, during a really difficult time for all of us all over the world as COVID-19 uh, continues in its second year as a pandemic. We've seen a lot of suffering and tragedy reflected in curves, which I look at every day. Uh, to the people of India um, who are still dealing with a devastating surge of COVID-19, I extend my deepest sympathies and concerns from a country that has been through and is still recovering from um, the enormous impacts of, of death and destruction um, caused by this disease. There's a lot of pain in these peaks. And uh, through it all, I've been largely limited to what I can do from my computer. Uh, the Smithsonian closed in uh, March 2020. And so I've been working from home ever since. Uh, this is the last photo that I have from my exhibit at the Smithsonian, uh, the one that I'm going to talk about today. It was taken the day before all the Smithsonian's museums closed to the public. Um, and it was taken by a journalist who interviewed me as I gave my last tour of the exhibit uh, before we shut down. The article um, addressed the irony of an exhibit about pandemics being closed by one. But I think that this photo here is even more ironic. Um, it shows a touch screen kiosk um, that we deactivated uh, in early March out of concerns about the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. In this photo of the kiosk uh, taken by me two years earlier, 
um, you can see why it's ironic uh, that we had to deactivate this feature due to COVID-19. Uh, the screens show a customized version of Health Map, letting our visitors see where in the world new outbreaks are happening and where new epidemic and pandemic threats may be emerging. Uh, these maps, um, you can't see them, but uh, they are there. Um, they were actually tracking reports of COVID-19 since January 2020. And the kiosk um, is located at the back of the exhibit, um, just where most of the visitors exit. Um, and above it, um, there's a quote from my colleague. Oh, hang on. There we go. From my colleague, Dan Lucy, um, giving a warning that we hoped that they would remember after they left. Um, and that is what is uh, next is already here. We just haven't recognized it yet. And even more ironically, um, just before this photo was taken, um, Tony Fauci was in the exhibit <laughs> commemorating its opening. Uh, the photo on the left there, that's our press preview uh, where Tony spoke about the importance of the exhibit, um, having been one of the many experts who helped us develop it. Uh, we were all very excited um, and looked forward to what we thought the exhibit could do for the public. Uh, given how many people come to our museum, as you can see from those crowds during our first week. That evening, we all celebrated. Um, everyone who had made Outbreak happen. On the right there uh, is me with Dan, um, with whom, uh, without whom the Outbreak exhibit uh, never would have happened. And in the rotunda, you can see hundreds more of our partners and supporters. These are the people um, that are the focus of my presentation today, uh, the kind of partnerships and collaborations that an exhibit like ours required. Um, I'm gonna talk about three ways uh, that experts outside the Smithsonian played a critical role in our project uh, by helping with uh, developing the content, by uh, participating in our public programs and by increasing our global reach. It all started uh, in 2014. I had just begun my job as a curator of biological anthropology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Um, and Dan was in West Africa, treating patients uh, on the front line of an Ebola epidemic. We have very different backgrounds and expertise. I study biological remains and people who lived in the past. Dan cares for the living um, and deals with diseases of today and pathogens of tomorrow. Uh, but one thing that we did have in common is that neither of us had done an exhibit before. Um, but Dan had this vision for a Smithsonian exhibit about epidemics and zoonotic diseases like Ebola, uh, which he proposed to our museum that summer. Dan was asked to help us develop the exhibit, and I was asked to be the lead curator of the project, and that is how we met. At that time, Ebola was a huge media story in the US, not only because it was unprecedented in scale uh, with you know, more than 11,000 deaths and, and close to uh, 30,000 cases by, by its end, um, but also because a few of those cases happened in the US, uh, which caused a massive panic about Ebola uh, during the fall of 2014. And it was clear um, to me, certainly, that most Americans um, had never heard of the disease before, uh, didn't know the transmission risks, and didn't really understand how this particular outbreak had started. And the thing is, Ebola was not a new disease in 2014, not even close. Uh, the causal pathogen has been known to science since 1976. And since then, it's caused dozens of outbreaks uh, in a number of African countries, as you can see there on the left. What was different in 2014 uh, was that this outbreak started in Western Africa, here in a region uh, that had never experienced an Ebola outbreak before. It was also the first time that Ebola reached major cities. Uh, the first cases were in a uh, remote um, village there uh, in southeastern Guinea. And the index patient was a two-year-old boy and uh, the disease spread 
from his family and, and to others, um, to his family and, and to others um, uh, that took care of them. And so, you know, it's important to realize that Ebola is an acute infection that in the past has tended to burn out in small uh, isolated communities. But in this outbreak, cases skyrocketed uh, as those infected with the virus uh, carried it into densely populated urban areas, um, including the capital cities of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Uh, one thing to know about Ebola is that it's a zoonotic disease, uh, meaning that it originates in and can spread to humans from other animals. Uh, bats are the most likely origin uh, of, the 19, uh, of the 2014 epidemic, given that RNA fragments of the virus were recovered from a bat captured near the uh, Liberia-Guinea border in 2019. But other mammals, such as non-human primates, can also be infected by and transmit the virus. The index patient was seen playing near a tree occupied by bats, uh, which may have been how that spillover, um, that cross-species transmission had occurred. Um, but hunting and butchering wildlife, that can also result in spillover. And human-to-human -human transmission can then occur quite rapidly uh, through cultural practices, for example, such as caring for the sick and the dead. But there are other bigger causes um, of, of epidemics, of infectious diseases that we wanted to highlight in the outbreak exhibit, um, using Ebola as just one example. Um, and these are causes um, of human activities that drive the emergence of new zoonotic pathogens and increase our risks of spillover and spread. For instance, uh, land use change and the disruption of natural habitats. The bats um, that were in the trees where the index patient was playing may have been displaced by recent deforestation and mining uh, and logging operations in the area. Uh, animal trait, which motivates people to hunt and sell wildlife, can bring together different species that normally don't meet and have different evolutionary adaptations and vulnerabilities to the pathogens that can spread between them. Urbanization is a process by which uh, many people come uh, to live uh, uh, closely together in large numbers, and it is partly why so many people were infected with Ebola in 2014. Large crowded population centers had grown uh, with rural to urban migration in recent decades and major road networks were built to link previously isolated uh, villages with larger towns and cities. So Ebola infected people were thus able to move rapidly to populous places and spread the virus widely. And finally, global travel, uh, that connects us all. Uh, infected people can carry viruses uh, just about anywhere in the world now, um, maybe even before they know that they're sick. Air travel was how Ebola reached the US uh, and a number of other countries uh, before the epidemic ended. Now, this uh, ecological perspective um, on epidemics that I've laid out for you, um, that's really aligned with the concept of One Health. Uh, that's a term that was coined by Billy Koresh in 2003 in an interview that he did with the Washington Post um, about uh, the devastating impact of Ebola on African apes. He had pointed out that gorilla deaths from Ebola had preceded human deaths from Ebola in the same region and should be warnings for future outbreaks. And he said, I'll quote, human or livestock or wildlife health can't be discussed in isolation anymore. There is just one health. So simply put, one health is the idea that human, animal, and environmental health are inextricably connected. Uh, it's also a framework for collaboration across different sectors and disciplines, integrating many different fields of expertise. And where a lot of these fields uh, converge is on problems related to zoonotic diseases and pandemic risks. And that is because there are so many emerging and re-emerging diseases around the world today. And the problems are so numerous. They are diverse and they are destructive and they are increasing. As you can see here, uh, we are not only seeing more and more of these diseases uh, over recent decades, but most of them are zoonotic. Um, and originate in wildlife in particular. 
So at my museum, we saw an opportunity with the outbreak exhibit to help the public understand how and why pandemics happen, focusing not on uh, the public health measures that can contain them, but on the ecological solutions that can prevent them. That made sense to us, um, given that we are one of the largest museums in the world, right in the heart of Washington, DC, uh, with a mission to understand the place of humans in the natural world. Uh, we knew that we would need a lot of partners, given that One Health is such an interdisciplinary subject, but we already had um, a trusted brand uh, and an enormous platform um, that allowed us to reach millions and millions of people. So we started to develop the exhibit in 2015. Um, in this photo, uh, you can see our core team, which included graphic designers, writers, educators, and of course, uh, a curator, me, uh, who is responsible for the scientific content. And you can see me in this photo, as always, with coffee and trying to absorb all of the input and everything I'm hearing um, from the people around me. Uh, at this meeting, we were at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, one of our partners in the exhibit who provided some video footage that we ultimately used um, in one of our multimedia pieces. I was ultimately responsible for the scientific content of the exhibit, but thankfully I had a lot of help. Uh, Dan was at just about every meeting that we had, I think, for the first year and a half. And we also had a fantastic advisory team with uh, diverse expertise who would periodically review the text and designs as we developed them. And those folks are all shown here. Um, they also helped us out with specific issues as needed. Uh, and John Epstein over here on the left, he gets the largest photo because uh, it's a very cool photo. And he was our chief science advisor. Uh, many other experts, um, often those who Dan knew and had long worked with also gave us input and were very generous with their time. This photo is from a meeting with Tony Fauci at the museum um, where he was talking and answering our questions about the of the HIV epidemic in America. Uh, it was Tony who told us that in order to get um, a more complete story, uh, we needed to talk to activists. And we did. Um, activists and survivors of epidemic diseases like AIDS provide us with some of the most powerful stories and experiences that we have in the exhibit. I would also uh, meet and talk with people in the global health community when I would go to professional meetings um, and sometimes give presentations about the exhibit as I did at the ministerial conference of the global health security agenda in 2016 in Rotterdam. And it was then ambassador Bonnie Jenkins at the US State Department, another one of our outbreak partners uh, who made that all happen. We also convened our stakeholders for day-long meetings at the museum uh, in order to present our progress on the exhibit and to get their feedback and answer their questions, of which they had many. Uh, we held, I think, four stakeholder meetings uh, like this, and uh, they were incredibly helpful for me because everyone was so knowledgeable and passionate and very much invested. Um, in what we were doing, which I guess isn't surprising, um, given that we were representing their work to the public. And for me, that was a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, but of course, we, we needed expert advice on actually creating the exhibit um, and making sure that every single detail was absolutely right, uh, because I am a perfectionist and uh, I was the person responsible for its accuracy. Um, and so if there was ever a question about uh, whether a model of, of bat um, was the right species, or if you know, those pots were really from Bangladesh, or if our games made sense, or if our characters had the right accents, um, I wanted to be assured that we could say yes. <laughs> and we could not have done anything without funding of course, and the outbreak exhibit required a lot of it. 
I'm really grateful to the fundraisers on our team, um, as well as to the generous donors who wanted to support this project. Uh, they're all listed here, and you can see that many of them also have expertise in outbreak science. Uh, but even so, it should be clear that our donors don't have any say or influence um, in the decisions that we make about our content. We do, however, look to our thought partners uh, for help with those decisions. I certainly always took their ideas and opinions into consideration. Um, and those intellectual contributions were just as valuable as money. Um, and those organizations and individuals that provided that expertise um, and all that help are listed here. In making the exhibit interesting and understandable um, to our visitors who uh, might be tired or rushed or looking for the dinosaurs, uh, our goal was to create immersive experiences that would allow them to engage with the content in different ways, but always meeting them where they are. And so you can see um, the different ways we try to do that. And here you can uh, see uh, some of the approaches we take to try to appeal to different types of learners and museum visitors. They're not all the same. Um, some people respond to ideas, others are um, really interested in, in data and information. Uh, some people need visuals, um, others like activities. Um, and we try to do all of this and more um, in support of a main message of One Health, of course. Um, and throughout the exhibit, we emphasize those human drivers of disease emergence that I had mentioned earlier, the, the land use change, the uh, animal trade, industrialized food production, urbanization, global uh, air travel, um, in order to help people understand the extent to which pandemic risks are controlled by human activities and behaviors. Um, you know, the I idea that uh, we are uh, the problem, sure, uh, but we can also be the solution. And we package a lot of this information um, in stories. We tell stories, real stories, um, that illustrate One Health concepts, such as spillover and the containment of outbreaks from Nipah virus uh, in Bangladesh, illustrating here the simple interventions that prevented uh, the transmission of Nipah virus uh, between bats and people via the consumption of contaminated deep calm sap. We tell the story of the international spread of SARS uh, from an animal market to an airport um, and how international cooperation and coordination uh, brought that epidemic under control. And actually right next to it uh, over here, we'll be updating um, content with a COVID-19 story as well. We tell the story um, as much as we can in our space of AIDS in America and around the world, uh, highlighting four decades of science and activism and healthcare and policy change. And of course, we do tell the story of Ebola in West Africa, uh, focusing in particular on how healthcare workers um, and communities broke that epidemic curve. One Health um, is our main message um, of the exhibit, but working together um, is our supporting message. Um, and uh, it's emphasized here um, in, with an interactive multiplayer game that simulates different roles in an outbreak response um, and in preventing the next one. Um, this is a supporting theme that we carry through um, all the sections of the exhibit. Um, and we always feature our partners, um, the real life experts in One Health, whose pictures and quotes um, are here to inspire our younger visitors to possibly follow these career paths. Um, and having those faces, um, having those uh, anecdotes, that is um, a really important way that we found we could personalize and humanize um, content that might otherwise be difficult to relate to. Um, it's a really effective way that we found in actually helping people um, uh, uh, take in information and retain it um, and they, when they go on their way. And in addition to giving us uh, their photos and their words, our partners also helped us train volunteers. Um, 
these volunteers are people who were in the exhibit every day in order to have conversations, um, answer questions, and do activities to help our visitors better understand the exhibit and anything else related to it. Some of our partners actually came into the exhibit uh, to have uh, their own conversations and to allow the public to speak directly with scientists. Uh, we call these programs The Expert is In, and this is Stuart Weston, a coronavirus expert from uh, University of Maryland, um, who I think did our first one about COVID-19 in February of last year. Our partners also participated in other types of programs um, that we have at the museum, such as panels and film screenings, uh, open houses and public forums. Um, and always they were representing a diversity of organizations and disciplines. Um, these programs, some of them went virtual during the, pro, uh, the, during the pandemic and our partners really stepped up um, to help us continue to educate and reach the public um, when we couldn't physically do so through nearly a dozen different webinars. All in all, I think we've done um, 40 programs for Outbreak uh, with 50 organizations and 92 experts. Most notable, uh, I think, is uh, that uh, the audience for the Outbreak programs is younger um, than our average uh, NMNH programs, 65% um, aged 19 to uh, 39 versus 50% in that demographic across the board. Uh, also, uh, as you can see on the right, um, I think it's very cool to see that the professional interests and positions of these audience members actually reflect the diversity of One Health. And the last way um, that our partners were really critical in making Outbreak uh, much more than an exhibit uh, was how they helped us with the initiative to share Outbreak with the world. Most of what I've shown you uh, of the exhibit and of our programs can only be experienced by people uh, who travel to uh, Washington DC or live there. Uh, yet, as we say in the exhibit, an outbreak anywhere is a threat everywhere. Um, people all over the world need uh, the, the kind of information that we present in outbreak, but you know, most of them can't or, or wouldn't come to us. And quite honestly, that information uh, for each community should be in their language from a local authority and specific to their particular needs and risks, um, which is not anything any one of us would know. Uh, so what we wanted to do um, was help communities around the world do outbreak themselves. So we created a, a toolkit from our exhibit uh, content that, that could be uh, digitally shared as files that anyone could show and use and print. We called the toolkit Outbreak DIY, um, and it's something that our museum had never tried before. Um, and I think that's probably because there's never been an exhibit that uh, so very much demanded it. I mean, first off, Outbreak DIY is free. Uh, that was really important for us. Um, users don't have to pay anything to access it, and they're not obligated to give us anything in return for using it. Um, it is versatile. It is uh, uh, consisting of, of many assets, um, and of them uh, that are included in the toolkit, uh, users are only required to use uh, two panels. Um, the rest of them are optional, so they can uh, take or leave them as they want. It's designed for flexibility, meaning that the files uh, that are supposed to be printed can be done so um, at different scales and in a variety of materials. It is multilingual in that we offer uh, translations of the content in 10 languages other than English. It's translatable uh, for users who want to do um, a translation of another language other than those that we offer. And it's customizable um, in far as we can uh, give people uh, the tools to create their own content and to integrate it with anything that we provide. The assets consist of 17 pre-designed panels um, that condense the main messages uh, and the concepts of Outbreak. Uh, these panels are available in English, um, bilingual format, and then open translation format. Um, there are also two blank panels um, that are the templates uh, for users to create their own content 
if they want. Um, and we do provide a style guide um, to help users make those panels consistent with the ones that we designed if they want. Um, the main difference uh, would be that the user designed panels uh, don't have the Smithsonian logo, um, unlike the pre-designed one. And that's because we didn't want to have to approve what people create, but at the same time, we couldn't take responsibility for it. We provide seven multimedia pieces um, the videos and interactive maps and games that are um, exactly what we have in the Outbreak exhibit and translated into 10 other languages. And there is a resource guide that summarizes uh, tips and suggestions from our team from a, a Smithsonian perspective, um, if people are interested, um, that can possibly help um, as, as novel uh, curators uh, and, and, and sort of new exhibitors um, create their own projects and, and need to find partners possibly in objects and, and plan out their spaces. If users uh, create an exhibit and they, and they wanna have volunteers as we do in ours, um, over there on the left, that shows uh, what they can access um, in terms of a, a online module uh, for all the materials that we use to train our volunteers, um, like videos and articles and assessments, uh, which is uh, available as they want. And we also provide there on the right, um, all the components and instructions for some of the games and programs that we created for Outbreak specifically. And lastly, to help people promote their exhibits or whatever they're doing, um, we offer poster and postcard templates um, so that they can uh, uh, you know, let that project be known and bring in as many people as they can. There have been uh, so many uses of Outbreak DIY since we launched the toolkit with the opening exhibit in, in 2018 that um, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the ways that our partners have used it. Uh, here, for example, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, there were a number of Outbreak DIY exhibits um, that Harvard's Global Health Institute developed with their international partners uh, with translations and, and customized panels in Cambodia, Bangladesh, Laos, and India. Um, and in India, in that photo there, you can see that uh, that display was part of an event with Ashish Jha, who was the director of the Institute at that time. A number of people in USAID's PREDICT project used Outbreak DIY to collaborate with their local partners um, and to communicate about their work uh, with local communities um, in those countries, uh, such as in Kenya, in Myanmar, in Jordan. Uh, they customized uh, Outbreak DIY for universities, for research centers, for embassies and museums. Um, I was fortunate to be able to see uh, that exhibit in Jordan uh, at the Children's Museum in Amman. And it was absolutely wonderful to see how it had been translated, uh, customized, and uh, made accessible um, and enjoyable for much younger visitors um, than uh, we often see. And lastly, the American Society for uh, Microbiology offered grants for members of their Young Ambassador program uh, to do Outbreak DIY in their home countries. It's a huge network, it's all over the world. Um, and so we saw a ton of these happen. I think that there were maybe 25 of them um, in places where we would never reach, like on a beach, in Copacabana in Brazil, or in gardens and hospitals in Yemen, um, or in community health centers in the DRC. Um, the use of Outbreak DIY in the DRC was particularly meaningful for me um, because it was actually used to educate the local community of Goma City about Ebola um, during an outbreak in 2018. Um, to me, that feels very appropriate. Uh, it's almost like things have come full circle given that Ebola was the catalyst for the outbreak exhibit in the first place. Um, and part of what uh, motivated me, um, really inspired me to, to do the exhibit was uh, just this, uh, this desire um, that I could somehow help, you know, be of some use in a situation like that. So again, these are just a few examples um, of how our partners have help to disseminate Outbreak DIY throughout the world. Um, but most of the uses of Outbreak DIY, um, actually, um, those have been by people who, who 
founded independently, or at least independent of um, any of our partner organizations. And uh, we've seen more than 200 uses of this toolkit since 2018 in at least uh, 47 countries. Because this is our first DIY exhibit as a museum and institution, we've got nothing to compare that to, but uh, by my uh, measure, that is pretty great. Um, there have been at least 12 translations uh, of the, the uh, DIY content in addition to those that we offer, um, and at least 50 panels customized from our templates, as well as uh, many, many settings um, in which uh, these materials have been used, um, from airports and libraries to parks and malls and markets uh, to schools and hospitals. Um, and you know, even though our biggest fear, um, I think, in creating Outbreak DIY was the material could be misused, you know, for purposes of misinformation, for example. Um, to my knowledge, nothing like that has happened, thankfully. So uh, if anyone in the audience is interested um, in using Outbreak DIY, um, please feel free to check it out on the museum's website here. Um, we actually have a number of DIY exhibits now. It's, uh, it's become a model of how we try to expand our reach. And I think that uh, we can drop a link um, into the text box to direct you to the right page should you want to get more information. And so in conclusion, um, I would just like to leave you all with a few uh, thoughts on how the experiences that um, I've shared with you from the past seven years um, bear on where we are today um, and the unknown future ahead of us. Uh, the outbreak exhibit will reopen to the public in one week, uh, so next Friday, uh, with new COVID-related content that we worked on um, as we were all at home um, after being closed for 15 months. I see this photo on the right here, um, which is a temporary display that we were uh, using to keep our visitors current on COVID-19 statistics before the exhibit closed. And I can hardly believe that there was ever a time when these numbers weren't in the millions. Every single visitor to our museum has now experienced a pandemic and tremendous loss because of it. Um, our audience is different. Um, and it makes me think about what the exhibit may have accomplished thus far and what it still might do. Because of Outbreak, I can really appreciate um, the importance of science communication um, during a pandemic, um, but also before one. Uh, outbreak was an enjoyable exhibit, truly, um, in pre-COVID times. Um, people found the information interesting. Um, it was lively, it was colorful, it was interactive. Um, and, and their experiences with the content, I think, um, seemed from my observations to be quite enjoyable, uh, quite positive. I don't think that people in general can respond to the same information in such a way during crisis conditions. Um, when there's fear and distrust of how governments and their fellow humans are reacting. Um, and so I think it's good to equip them with some understanding of what's happening um, or could happen before they are faced with it. Outbreak also made me appreciate the unique and important role that museums play in society as places to convene conversations and to contextualize events in a uh, much bigger frame than our daily lives and personal experiences. Um, and for many people, museums are also trusted authorities um, as arbiters of truth, as stewards of knowledge, um, because they're not seen as biased in the way that uh, other sources of information such as the media are often perceived. Um, and that has a lot of value um, when that is uh, something that we are facing and battling um, in a situation as we are in right now. Collaboration is critical to One Health, uh, which means that is critical to pandemic prevention. Um, I hope that from my presentation, you've understood why it's so important for people across disciplines to work together for One Health and in communicating about it because no one person or community of people knows it all or can do it all. From, uh, from the Outbreak Exhibit and its programming, I have also seen how empowering knowledge can be, um, how much that uh, people want information 
about things they don't understand um, and or view is important um, and the confidence and the comfort you can sense from someone when they do get information that they think that they can use and that they want to share. And the final thought that I'll leave you with um, is that we're all in this together. <laughs> um, I am definitely grateful to be in this uh, with the people I got to meet and work with um, on the Outbreak exhibit. And yeah, I'm happy to be in this with all of you as well. Um, watching Outbreak DIY spread around the world and how it's been used in like endless ways, but with a common purpose uh, that reinforces for me the universal challenges of pandemic threats and the necessity of embracing global unity and our shared humanity in fighting them. And so with that, um, I will just say thank you very much um, to, you know, uh, all, 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 all our partners and many more um, who I've uh, talked a bit about today. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sabrina. For some reason, my video will not start, but it's in the meanwhile. Okay. This was fabulous. Um, it, it is, uh, it is very useful given the work that we are trying to do as well. Uh, we are, we are not a museum in quite the same way as, um, uh, you, you know, the Museum of Natural History, because we are not mm -hmm. collections based, but we are a museum like space in the sense that we also work towards, we are a public space for science, as you very rightly said, you know, that we, we have the same mandate in a sense of convening public conversations around um, concerns and crises um, and uh, well not only crises but also you know uh, other things and uh, we also hope to engage the public in matters that um, impact their lives the way in which a pandemic does uh, but also many other things so it's 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 really wonderful to be able to listen to you walk through your journey of producing Outbreak up until DIY Outbreak, uh, mm -hmm. which incidentally we tried to access. Um, what we realized was that um, the Smithsonian was quite uh, happy to loan it to us to make things, but right. a physical exhibition, not an online one. And so lack of lack of foresight. We, I mean, in so many ways, you know, there's so many things I would do differently uh, from those sort of uh, perspectives. Um, had yeah, we yeah, yeah. No, we but should, nonetheless, should. I mean, there's, the doors are still open. Yeah. They open until December 31. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I, I think, um, so um, public spaces for science, and I'd love to talk more about it. And we'll look mm -hmm. at the questions from the audience as well. And what we did, the reason why I, I bring this, um, uh, bring the DIY thing up is also because we worked with one of SITES' uh, traveling exhibitions, which was H2O mm -hmm. Today, when we did our first uh, full exhibition season, which was Submerge. Uh, which was about yeah. water and at that point sites uh, allowed us to in a way redesign the content like you mentioned but it, we were printing it so the the uh, we chose images that were more relevant to our audiences we added a few slides uh, not slides a few panels that spoke um, you know to local conditions and uh, we were able to add that and i, I uh, so our audiences uh, you know you can check our website for submerge and you'll find the images there and and the lovely panels uh, also from the smithsonian so it's a it's a it, i can i can testify to that, that it's a fabulous thing it's a fabulous thank thing you. because thank you um, Yes. Yeah, you know, it, I, well, thank you for that, you know, and uh, people, you know, uh, I think um, may not realize that it, it was a new thing for museums in general, we could find no examples of a museum trying something like this, um, you know, making um, sort of versions of their exhibit available um, for free and inviting, encouraging, helping people to, to, to adapt that content um, to their, their own settings and purposes. Um, I should also be thanking our lawyers at the Smithsonian who came up with, uh, you know, sort of um, the, the, the framework um, and the agreement that allowed that to happen because there was a lot of concern, as I mentioned, about misuse. Um, and then also and how we know right? it's, it's, yeah. it, it goes against sort of everything that, you know, we're used to, I guess, thinking about ourselves um, in that we would set free 
um, this information um, in such a such a way um, that uh, we didn't really know what would happen. Um, but I'm so glad that we did, um, and because you know, of course, customization. And that's important just to be able to address local concerns when you're talking particularly about diseases. But as, as you would know, as you know, I think any museum person would know, um, you have to make content relevant. Yes. You, you, people have to see themselves um, yeah. in what you're presenting or it's, it's not gonna stick. It's not gonna yeah. make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Accessibility matters hugely. Like, I mean, that's what we do. But I think one, one thing, um, and which is I'm fairly certain apparent to um, those of uh, those of us listening in today, but also otherwise, is that a hell of a lot of work goes into making an exhibition. It's a long, um, you know, and it was great to see Tony Fauci in the images. Uh, yeah. It tells you what it takes. It tells you it tells you that it takes people who are seriously committed to you know making it accurate. It tells you it takes several months. It tells you a lot of it takes the work of a lot of people. I mean, if interdisciplinarity matters to handle pandemics, uh, yeah. like you know, through the concept of One Health, uh, as we're trying to bring things together, it matters a lot in bringing an exhibition together. And this is something that my team and I also, you know, have been learning again and again with every exhibition that we do. And so therefore to have all of that effort in a sense dismantle once the exhibition is over, mm -hmm. also feels like it's not very good use of that effort, especially for us, because we mainly, not mainly, we only do temporary exhibitions. Yeah. And so for us, it's really, um, I mean, it's it's a great idea to be able to you know just take that and and uh, allow others to actually use it uh, because it speaks um, so well to uh, to the work that we all do and you know it's in a yeah. sense shared labor. So I'm I'm very very happy with that idea. Let me let me stop talking and take some questions before and sure. then let's come back to chatting again. Yeah yeah. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you faced while first curating this exhibition? And uh, the second, when you were expanding your reach. So like, what were the key challenges you would say? I mean, the, everything, was, you know, the lots right. of challenges. Yeah, a lot of challenges. Um, well, as, as you know, I, I, I uh, hope everyone would have gathered um, for, you know, from what I, I've shared about my background and expertise, I had a lot to learn, you know, about, about these other fields and um, the work of, um, so many of these folks um, that were um, coming to speak to us. I mean, I wish I could tell you that, you know, uh, uh, when we were seeing now Tony Fauci and he was explaining, you know, sort of the history of HIV, that uh, none of it was news to me or, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I was really able to engage, you know, as a peer about these matters. I was learning. I was learning from him. I was learning from every one of our partners every time I had a conversation with them. And so part of that is um, learning their language. Every scientific uh, area, every type of scientist has their own vocabulary and um, culture in, in some respects. And um, for me as an anthropologist, um, you know, speaking of epidemiologists um, and, and uh, infectious disease physicians, I mean, that again, um, that is, uh, that was a challenge. Um, another uh, challenge, I would say, in developing the content was uh, not in what we uh, decided, what knowing what I wanted to be uh, in in the exhibit. Um, you know, we decided very early on about our messages, and you know that uh, you know sort of um, how we were going to support those, but you also have to make a decision about what you're not going to include in your exhibit. There is a, just a universe of information out there that is interesting and is relevant and mm -hmm. it just can't fit. Uh, you can't have it all. And so, uh, for example, we had to make the hard decision that we were only going to feature and, and focus on zoonotic viruses. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't, you know, get into the stories of, uh, you know, of, um, bacterial diseases um, and other types of pathogens. Uh, those are very important, uh, but mm -hmm. we did not feel that we could um, appropriately um, uh, explain um, and really um, you know, uh, feel confident that people would understand everything we thought they need to know about viruses without also trying to um, fit in and differentiate other types of pathogens. And you know, no one wanted anyone walking out of the exhibit being confused about which was which and when vaccines are appropriate and when uh, antibiotics are appropriate and, and when not. So we did 
make that choice. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it was the right one, but um, if I had another go at it or more space, um, certainly <laughs> that's, that would be at the top of my list of something to include. Um, and then for um, the global reach, um, I think that certainly one challenge, and I think, you know, we sort of addressed it um, here is, uh, you know, just trying to, um, you know, make something that, that you know, uh, uh, is very simple, um, mm -hmm. um, as accessible as we want it to be. We wanted to cut down the paperwork. We wanted to lower the barriers. Um, and, you know, certainly with, uh, you know, um, the many creative ways that people were coming up with using that content, they were sort of uh, thinking of things that we hadn't considered. Mm -hmm. Like, can you do a digital display of this? Can you do an online display? Of, of a DIY exhibit. Uh, in principle, it sounds great. It makes sense, but um, you know, it just, um, it went beyond the scope of really, you know, how we may have even um, uh, considered uh, uh, just how great that reach would be. Mm -hmm. And so that was a challenge, just trying to deal with um, more of the administrative aspects um, and the logistics of, of, of something like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, just, um, I don't know, trying to, um, you know, keep track of, of all the things that people were doing was uh, a challenge, but a wonderful one. And so I got really good at, you know, finding uh, pictures on social media, because uh, we didn't make anyone send us anything. We were grateful for photos, but didn't require it. Um, but I always want to know because I wanted to, of course, let others know about it. Um, and it really helped me to understand, um, certainly as an anthropologist, um, I found it very interesting um, how people mm -hmm. were differently interpreting and using content um, with very few um, instructions and limitations from us. Okay. So what was the response like of the audiences that came in, you know, when the exhibition was on physically? So because, you know, now it's very different. Um, yeah. What did yeah. you see? Yeah. I mean, I, so the Outbreak uh, Gallery, um, it's actually right under my office. Like I could walk through it every day, um, you know, uh, and um, observe. And I often did because I really wanted to know. Um, I wanted to see if people were playing the games, you mm -hmm. know, were they, were they enjoying it? In, uh, were people, you know, reading that text that I fought to include that the writer told me no one would look at? Um, were um, were people um, talking to our volunteers? I would ask our volunteers quite often, what kind of questions did you get today? What do people want to know? What don't they understand? Um, and so from all of that investigative uh, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, work, I can say that people really did have a good time um, in, that, in, in the exhibit, um, despite the fact that the subject matter is serious, um, is scary for some, um, you know, uh, we really thought about ways that we could uh, make it hopeful and empowering uh, with things like action items um, and sort of, um, you know, uh, positive stories of success. Mm -hmm. Um, things that people could look at um, and think about um, to see actually, you know, um, uh, that it's possible. Um, it works that there are people out there and um, all of us together can, can make some positive changes um, towards One Health. And so if anyone is walking out of, of an exhibit um, depressed um, mm -hmm. or, or scared um, or not feeling like it matters, like that there's not anything that they can do or even, that they don't even want to know anything more because like they're done with it, then, you know, that is, I think, um, that's unfortunate. That's, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. not meeting your goals, um, you know, as, a, as an exhibit team. And, you know, I'll also say about that, that, as I mentioned, I'd never done an exhibit before. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist. I was, you know, hired uh, primarily for my my research background and skills. Um, those are, remain sort of uh, the most in, important qualities on which I'm assessed. Yeah. Um, exhibits are, are, you know, sort of a, a wonderful but additional opportunity that we have for outreach. Yeah. And so, coming into this this uh, experience with outbreak, 
you know, I didn't really think about these things. Um, I thought that if you're trying to uh, uh, put a positive spin on something uh, scary, if, uh, if, if, you, if you don't want to like just shake someone, you know, into paralysis, um, then, uh, then, you know, you're, you're dumbing it down, you're sugarcoating it, you're not doing right by, by the, the, the science. Um, however, um, I came around on that. I, I really came to appreciate, um, you know, how um, uh, just, as I said, like meeting people on their terms, you know, mm-hmm. and making mm-hmm. information accessible um, yeah. and uh, making your, um, your, your, your content, I guess, um, effective, that, 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 is, that is not the same thing. That is, that is exactly what you should be trying to do. Lovely. I, I'm going to have, I mean, I, I would love to ask you something more about you being a biological anthropologist simply because that's not a usual profession and more so yeah. in India where this sort of, you know, um, nestling of the natural and human sciences is almost non-existent. Uh, but what I'm, but before I ask you some, uh, before I ask you more about that and its relationship to public engagement and the kind of work that you have done and the kind of, so I'm a historian of science by training. So, so oh. um, uh, I have some observations on that, but before I come to that, there's a there's a question. Uh, there are three questions from okay. uh, from a colleague and a dear friend uh, in the audience uh, who's a, who's who's um, well, who has a PhD in biology and also a PhD in history of science. I mean, I know that so it's unfair advantage, John, but anyway, never mind. So he has he. I'll read you his questions one by one. His okay. first question is: You've brought outbreak to contagion which correspond to the names of two major motion pictures from the 1990s and early 2010s, respectively. Do you, in your exhibition, respond to such events because they have been so largely in the public eye? Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I, I interpret the question to be, um, were we influenced by or inspired by films? Is that right? Or sort of- uh, oh, Probably that, the, the, I mean, I, I guess one that, and then that, the fact that we pick up topics like this because they, in a way, speak to them. yeah yeah i think so um i didn't i haven't seen the film outbreak actually but i have seen contagion uh which is quite good but was very you know well advised i mean they had um tremendous consultants yeah, yeah. and you know um and so i think that you know it, it was accurate and I, I i imagine that you know it's not so different actually um mm-hmm. you know I, I got to meet the the um the writer um, the screenwriter of Contagion, um, actually at an event um, at Harvard um, Global Health Institute's Outbreak Week, and so they screened it, and 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 he talked, and and so I was able to chat with him, and you know what I what I heard him saying about the film, um, I could relate. It, it actually relates to what I was just saying about being uh, being positive, being hopeful. He actually said you have to give people hope. Yes, and so. Um, I guess that happened in Contagion. I mean, it was still sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it was um, certainly a, a serious film um, uh, with a great, you know, sort of uh, final, final ending where you see how the transmission, how the spillover actually happened. But those sort of cinematic tactics, I would say, um, that kind of storytelling, I think that that is, uh, that's consistent and, and that's definitely the same kind of thing that we do. And so I think that the the kinds of subjects that would make a great film also make a great exhibit. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing to, to consider. Um, but also, you know, um, for us, just the, the urgency and the, um, sort of the, the, the depth of, um, sort of the scientific, um, uh, presentation that, that we felt we could give to this, um, seemed to be really important. Mm -hmm. Um, and all of our partners, although of course that is their, that is their bread and butter. That is what they do. Um, they are the experts in this area. They do not have the, 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 the 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 space the building all of the other um, uh, assets that we do in yeah. order to yeah. do something in that in that way yeah and I mean it's our mandate right and we do this right absolutely in order yeah. to, I mean, we, we, are, we are the bridges between research and the public in a sense yeah. we in fact tried to get Ian Lipkin to come speak at Contagion but uh, we didn't manage that much <gasps> oh <interview>. yeah he's <laughs> nice <laughs> we'll try we'll try so I'll read you John's second question. As a biological anthropologist, where do you see the first tangible points of evidence regarding zoonotic disease in the ethnographic present? Are we largely dependent on the information inferred from contemporary knowledge? 
And mm. if not, how is this history effectively deployed? Uh, that is a good question. Um, and uh, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, I think about and um, that is driving um, mm. some of my research right now. Um, you know, I'm trained as an osteologist and, and for a long time, the only way that we could identify, you know, a disease process, mm. you know, or, um, or try to diagnose um, some sort of condition in the skeleton was uh, through lesions, you know, through just mm -hmm. sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, some sort of um, activity in the bone that would have required, you know, um, that agent to, um, to, to infect bone. So mm -hmm. it's very limited. It's very limited. And also you need to, um, you know, sort of have a chronic disease. So acute infection is not going to show up in the skeletal record. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, with advances in biomolecular methods um, uh, in anthropology, um, there's so much more information that we can uh, recover about the microbes themselves. And so, um, you know, my colleagues and I, um, it's, it's interesting, just, uh, uh, I think it was just last week or the week before, very recently, a um, uh, couple of folks went into the outbreak exhibit to actually remove one of the specimens that we have on display, a specimen of uh, a bird um, from uh, 1916, I believe, in, 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 uh, in North America um, that had been part of a study to um, try to recover evidence of um, uh, avian influenza that may have contributed to to um, the uh, pandemic strain of 1918. Mm -hmm. And so my colleagues and I are now um, revisiting these old samples and specimens in order to try to recover whole genomes um, of pathogens yes. in the past, um, mm -hmm. which um, you know, will allow us to better understand their evolutionary history um, mm -hmm. and the role of humans within it. So I think that that's the most exciting way that we can start to look at these questions. And it's not, it's not looking directly um, at people, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, I've, I, I long uh, have uh, sort of accepted in my research that I'm always, I'm always thinking about people. I'm always trying to learn about people, but I'm not always um, uh, looking at them directly, but more indirectly at their impacts and their mm -hmm. effects on other organisms. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's exciting work and uh, stay tuned. I, we, I look forward to updating the outbreak exhibit with uh, findings from that research as well. Fabulous, Anna, I, I look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of whether I can come to DC or not. Yeah, um, um, I hope so. I hope I would love to I, uh, I, give a tour. Yes, I, 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 I miss so much um, being able to meet with colleagues and you know, walk through the exhibit and, and just yep. particularly now, um, it's just, it's really important and probably yes. for many of us, um, just being separated, you know, and unable to travel has been so hard. It is indeed. I'll ask you John's third question. Sure. How do you in museums navigate political quagmires, including changing terminologies? where at one point we speak of a UK and Indian variant, later tending mm. to Alpha Delta after a fashion, and also such issues as say drug dissemination, including the production of generic drugs in the global South, vis-a-vis -vis intellectual property in the countries of the North, et cetera. So, you know, how do, right. you, how do you deal with this in the museum context? Good question. Well, so it is a good question. Um, and so when it comes to terminology and any that may um, be stigmatizing, Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, just um, uh, uh, maybe um, confusing or uh, um, would lead someone to misinterpret um, things about, about, those, uh, about the meaning of those terms. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, well, for one, um, you know, there's nowhere in the exhibit, I think, where we call the 1918 pandemic Spanish flu, ah. right? Um, and um, you know, we have these kinds of conversations and this is, you know, one, one instance when um, I found it particularly useful um, to have people like Dan, um, John, many others who, um, if something that didn't even occur to me would be able to flag anything mm -hmm. that, you know, um, might present those challenges. But in terms of how you keep up with changes um, with terminology, I mean, so you, 
try to update if you can it um you can you can put some markers sometimes of you know just sort of like uh to make people aware that you know uh these updates uh don't happen immediately mm -hmm. um you can use your volunteers to explain um okay. that uh that uh distinction or that disconnect for people um as i hope that we can do um on you know subjects of um you know uh, novel vaccine technologies like mrna vaccines i mean we mm -hmm. We, we didn't really have the opportunity um, or the time to really um, address that, you know, and thinking about these COVID-19 updates. And so I've, you know, already started conversations about how can our volunteers in the very least talk about it and just make it a teachable sort of uh, moment maybe um, if there's mm -hmm. something that, you know, maybe should be updated and isn't. Uh, why is that? And, you know, sort of, um, you know, what's the importance? And then for issues, I guess uh, we were sort of talking about um, issues of, of equity, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just about um, about distribution of, of uh, therapeutics, is that right? And yeah. vaccines and yeah. all of that. I mean, that's something that um, that that absolutely um, is part of, of stories that that you know we we tell and information that we provide. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a position of um, not um, not uh, not advocating for policies at our museum. We we you know um, think of ourselves and present our, ourselves as apolitical, um, but we we absolutely um, present uh, facts um, and scientific evidence um, as it's it's very important for people to think about um, and the ethics concerning you know um, uh, ethical issues concerning um, a lot of the things related to pandemics. That's huge. And so, for example, when we were um, when we were designing the, the the timeline of HIV AIDS, I mean, we were um, very explicit about you know um, sort of what what the government you know did not do. The U.S. government um, ignoring the crisis, presidents not mentioning it, all of that, you know, um, and um, trying to be, um, I would say unflinching at how we look mm -hmm. at even mm -hmm. painful um, and problematic parts of these histories because they are critical. Um, and, and making sure that even in the present that um, we represent what we can and that we have our volunteers prepared to have, you know, um, challenging conversations. Um, and, you know, that um, our values are always reflected um, in everything that we're putting out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, in a, in a way, we are, I'm going to sound really hard when I say this, but we are peddling knowledge in a sense, right? Like, and, and we've got to be very sure that we're doing the right thing, we're saying the right things, and we give the right message in a sense, with, because at the end of the day, the responsibility that we have is towards the public, because that's um, that's why we exist. So that's, that's really great. What I'm going to start, so John, thanks you for the answers. Um, I, I'm going to take, uh, take a last question. Um, which will uh, to which I'll add my own. Oh, oh wait, I have to ask you about the biological anthropologist thing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, let me let me ask this question and then I'll ask you one more. Yeah. So, it, uh, one of, one of our audience members basically, I mean, you know, is worried that we'll forget even this pandemic, and in a sense, not you know, not have the wherewithal and the ability to um, to do things right like that we yeah. get on with our lives in a sense and and there therein i think to add to that question lies the responsibility that we have as museums and public spaces for science to yes. to keep sort of you know the relevance of this memory um alive or to establish mm -hmm. the relevance of this experience for our future um you know lives as well and and that of future generations so how do you how do you think you will approach the refreshing of outbreak and i'm guessing you know the smithsonian has absolutely no other option than to refresh outbreaks as soon as you can yeah 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 so i mean i can't um yeah um i i don't know um you know we've got maybe a a, a year left in the run once we reopen mm -hmm. a year uh, perhaps and um you know, we'll, we'll see um, with updates, generally it is, um, you know, if something is is wrong, you know, or shown to be wrong, you know, if, if the science, you know, begin, uh, shows something else, that's absolutely necessary. We can't have incorrect information mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, but in terms of what um, what's important and relevant, you know, um, that, uh, you know, we want people to know, um, it, it's hard to say how much space we'll have to do that, you know, as, um, as we were designing the 
exhibit, um, I would have all these great ideas, you know, of, of things to me, great ideas of stuff that I wanted to add. And they came to me always like late, late in the process of, you know, when we're about to, you know, send, you know, something to production and print or when yes. we just signed off on the last version. And so, um, uh, you know, our, our, our writer on, on the exhibit, I mean, she was just wonderful. She always listened to me, but, um, you know, and tried to accommodate me when I, I would try to sort of get more um, stuff in, but mm -hmm. she would not do so at the expense of something else. She would not compromise on our word counts, on mm -hmm. our formats, mm -hmm. like rightly so, you know, mm -hmm. when you start just putting more words into a, a you know, a, a block, when it starts just growing um, to the point where no one's going to read it, um, that's really where you, that's, that you, you reach a point that is counterproductive to your goals. And so mm -hmm. she would say to me, if I want to add something and she'd be like, okay, then tell me what we're going to take out. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for me to think with our space, what we put in um, concerning COVID that I could do without um, mm -hmm. that's already there. So, you know, I, I pointed out where we are replacing one interactive, uh, which I, I thought, you know, was um, acceptable with COVID content. Um, we chose to design um, some updates that um, are about the beginning of the pandemic because we didn't know how it would end, but we certainly know how it started. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I really wanted to focus on the story of what we didn't have, uh, what we didn't do, what we should have um, been able to achieve, you know, to, to bring this under control. Basically, I thought that that needed to be on the record, um, you know, sort of in this context that people wouldn't forget that it did not have to be this bad. Um, and so I hope that, uh, that, 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 um, that people, uh, uh, enjoy and engage with that. We'll see. Um, but, Otherwise, um, it's really difficult to say. I mean, that is that's another challenge of just being at a museum, being in the museum world. Yeah. Always our partners would ask me, like in the years that we spent developing the exhibit, like when does it open? Has it opened yet? As, you know, I mean, people who like respond to things like, you know, rapidly, um, you know, sort of by necessity could yeah. not comprehend the glacial pace of our process. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, in the same way, like we just... Um, we are not agile in ways that mm -hmm. other, um, you know, sort of uh, institutions can be, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, just a trade-off um, yes. for, you know, all of the, the many advantages that we have, but there it is. Yep. No, but I mean, you know, so we are at the exact other end, right? Like we, we change our exhibitions mm -hmm. in peacetime, so to speak, um, you know, every oh, three to four good. months, right? Yeah. So it's okay, yeah. no collections. So in that sense, uh, it's a, it, we have the agility, as you said, but it, it also comes at its at uh, with its own costs, right? Um, yeah. The the I mean, museum exhibitions stay. They stay sometimes for decades. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, uh, they endure. But it's also interesting mm -hmm. to see because they're planned that way to endure, right? And therefore, what is what gives it its stability is also not uninteresting at all. I mean, you know, um, it's uh, it, yeah. No, it would be lovely to discuss this with you in in some other context. But let let me not let me not uh, let me not keep you for too long. Let, just one more okay. question, sure. because sure. because like I said at the start, not at the start, somewhere in between, that a, a biological anthropologist is not someone you meet very easily uh, in mm -hmm. India, even like you don't easily meet a historian of science in India. But yeah. there are some of us, I don't think I have met a biological anthropologist in India. So I think it would be just lovely if you told us uh, what it is that biological anthropologists do, what your research sure. is, and sure. what took you to curating. Okay, so um, biological anthropology is a, um, a subfield of anthropology um, that focuses on the biological aspects of humanity. Okay, mm -hmm. and so that is everything from um, from our our anatomy, okay, like our, our physical um, sort of uh, humanity, um, to you know, in some ways, um, our uh, cellular and, and molecular biology, to our genetics, to even our behavior and our interactions with the environment. I mean, I think that anything that can be understood about people um, through biological remains. Mm -hmm. um, or tissues, I, I would say, I would say, um, are, uh, 
would classify. But that's that's a general idea that it's just basically trying to think about all the ways from evolution to um, to to ecology, um, what what being human means. And so my research, um, some people are, are, are very focused, you know, they uh, specifically um, you know, we'll study, uh, for example, paleopathology. They're just experts in diseases in the human skeleton mm -hmm. and in the past, and they can diagnose them mm -hmm. and they can interpret them and, you know, sort of, um, and they can see patterns across skeletons and regions and time mm -hmm. um, and reconstruct historical epidemics and um, disease events. Um, some people uh, focus on, uh, you know, maybe a, a certain region, for example, and they just know a lot about the population history. Mm -hmm. um, of, uh, of an area that you can learn through through remains, um, everything from um, activity patterns that may manifest to um, reflections of diet and how that may have changed and, and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. My research has actually evolved um, sort of as I've been at the museum and I've been immersed in a, a research environment with so many other um, scientists of uh, such diverse fields and, and, and disciplines, even within natural history science, mm -hmm. you know, um, all of the, the different zoologists um, and, and um, you know, the people in mineral science and uh, the folks in entomology and, and invertebrate zoology. And so it makes me think about, you know, humans as just one species, again, uh, among so many and just sort of uh, having, you know, just one part and, and sort of, um, you know, always engaged with, um, so many other organisms. And so that's where I, I've started to really look at the intersections of humans, animals, and the environment. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very interested um, in ways that we can see um, the impacts of, of humans and, and human modified environments on other animals, um, everything from like captive uh, settings to, you know, sort of um, uh, other ways that, that humans um, have uh, altered um, ecosystems and habitats. I am, as I mentioned, very interested in ways that we can recover, um, uh, you know, ancient and historic um, genetic information about pathogens that can better help us uh, understand uh, their evolutionary history and um, and uh, their 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 diversity and uh, their relation to to the things that we experience today. Um, and I'm very interested, actually, and in, I've, I've done quite a bit of work in uh, um, environmental health and particularly in uh, anthropogenic or human created um, contaminants um, and how those have um, impacted and, and are reflected in different patterns that we can understand through time. Hmm. No, it's absolutely fascinating. You know, I mean, um, on occasion when, when I when I talk to people to, you know, to explain why we are not a museum and, you know, why we are a gallery. Yeah which is yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And often talk yeah. about why museums came into being and museums were about research collections. And, you know, and the, so yeah. it, it's really sort of, it's fabulous to kind of, you know, reassert to our audiences that there are museums which have historical collections, which are actively used by researchers, right? Like, so, so yes. they're, they're public spaces, but from a time when natural history, natural philosophy and moral philosophy were the order of the day, and a museum was a place for knowledge making primarily and the public yes. was a participant in it. And I think that's- Yes, absolutely. You know, and I showed you the photo of our museum and it's huge, but only a third of that space is actually, um, you know, uh, for the public. Yeah. Um, most of our space, our museum is actually research space. It's behind the scenes. No one ever sees it. There are labs, right. there are offices, there are all kinds of facilities um, that okay. you wouldn't know. Yeah. I'm gonna come and I'm gonna see it. So I'd love okay. to do that. Good, good. So, Thank you so much, Sabrina, for taking the time okay. to be with us this evening. This was wonderful. Thank you for your generous engagement with the of questions course. as well. Okay. Um, for those of you who would like to go ahead and share Sabrina's lecture with your friends and, uh, you know, probably even your students, um, the lecture will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And in case you missed any of our previous uh, 20 odd lectures, do check them out there as well. Um, I'd like to say here that the first phase of Contagion comes to a close on Sunday. Uh, a part, one exhibit from our 16 exhibits will no longer be with us because the Cooper Hewitt in New York wants to borrow it. Uh, that's, how, oh. at least that's how I would like to put it. Um, <laughs> well, it's going there. Uh, so we will no longer have it, unfortunately. Yeah. So do explore a cluster of 17 cases by Blast Theory, which explores events that took place in the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, where oh. the first cluster of SARS cases were detected in 2003. Sabrina, happy to send you a link to it as well. Oh, see, uh, yeah. Don't miss watching the five films, which are still available to see. A Human Question, 
uh, by Jayashri T, Disease by Miriam Ghani, Survivors by Arthur Pratt, and um, The Periwig Maker, and Where Birds Dance Their Last by Lena Bui, a Vietnamese filmmaker. They're all a part of our film series. Um, do join us over the next two days. Um, and, you know, uh, the closing lecture will be, as I said, by Jeremy Farrar, uh, Director of the Wellcome Trust. Um, tomorrow, digital epidemiology, several workshops. Do look at our website. Do continue to um, engage with us this weekend. And we promise you there's going to be a big surprise next month when we launch phase two. Thank you again, Sabrina. It was wonderful to have you with us this evening and this morning for you. So have yes. a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you all for joining us this evening and um, look forward to engaging with you further. Goodbye and good night. Bye.